so I'm going to do that now and and we'll get started so let me just check make sure we're on and it looks like we are so again we're going to be looking at an interesting topic tonight and we're looking at the power of fasting you can't really see it behind me but you can see there the power of fasting I should have kind of put it up a little bit higher but anyway that's the title of today's study and so we're going to go ahead and get started I want to again welcome you and I thank God for this opportunity to even be able to share with you tonight and I pray that each and every one of us will get something new possibly out of this study that we're going to go into tonight so we're going to go ahead and get started it's now 7 14 and so I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads with me as we um, pray but before we pray I want to check one more thing here just want to check one more little thing and then we'll get started all right we're going to go ahead and get started now so let us pray Dear loving Father, we want to thank you once again for sparing our lives. We thank you, dear Lord, for this opportunity to come together and to study your word. And so, Lord, at this time, we dedicate our lives to receiving from your throne. I pray, dear God, that you would empty me of self, cleanse me of all unrighteousness, and I pray that you will use me as your mouthpiece as we come before you and we ask that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher. We pray that your angels will surround us. We pray that you keep our minds focused and fixed upon you and every distraction banished from our uh, places of abode. And Lord, we pray for all those that might even see this in the future, that this study will be a blessing to every person that, that uh, listens to it. And so dear Father, take charge now, for we turn this over to you and we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, according to your will, with thanksgiving. Amen. All right, so we're going to be looking at several historical events in this study in regard to fasting. We're not going to be looking at necessarily the, um, the physical aspect of fasting. We're not, going to, we're not going to be going into the physical aspect of fasting. We're going to go into the more spiritual aspect of fasting because I think that is more important. I think they're both important, but I think the spiritual aspect of fasting is very important for us, especially for those that are preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ. So today we're going to be taking a look at several historical events in the Bible in which the power of fasting brought forth miraculous results. And I'm sure that everybody on this in this study would want that for themselves. Miraculous results as a result of proper fasting. So we want to study these things for the purpose of understanding the significance of a practice that is seldom understood in the spiritual context. We often hear ministers recommending fasting when there is great difficulty in different areas of our lives. One story is often referred to more than others, I think, in the Bible when uh, people talk about fasting or ministers talk about fasting. One story stands out. And I believe that that story, because what happens is that uh, they attempt to reveal, when they, when they talk about this particular story or this historical record, it is in an attempt to reveal to the subject the power available in prayer and fasting. And that story is found in Matthew chapter 17. So for those of you that have your Bibles, you can open up to Matthew 17, but or you could just write it down. I, I recommend that you just write the references down and then go back and look at them later. Because sometimes I move a little quickly and I'm not going to have necessarily enough time to fit everything that I want to fit into this presentation if uh, you know I have to stop for everybody to kind of follow along with me. So Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 to 21. This is the story that many pastors and ministers talk about when they're talking about fasting to kind of display or express the power available in prayer and fasting. Notice here. 
And when they, speaking of Christ and the disciples, were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, it's kne well, kneeling down to who? To, to, to Christ and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. So this man came to Jesus Christ and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. So here this man is he's desperate. His son is, you know, has lost his mind. He's controlled by some demonic forces where he throws himself into the fire and water. I mean, he's, he's, he's hurting himself. And, you know, that's very dangerous. And his father's very concerned. He comes to Christ. And so then he tells him, listen, I brought my son or I brought him to the disciples, to thy disciples. But they could not cure him. Then, so Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. So here we see Jesus is, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a certain sense, he's rebuking, well, he's actually rebuking, for sure, his disciples. Because this man brought this, his son to, to the disciples and they could not cure this son. So Jesus tells them they are perverse, they're faithless, and he tells the man, please bring him to me. So Jesus rebukes the devil. And immediately what happens? The, de the devil departs out of the young man. And the child was cured from that very hour, we're told. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. That's interesting, isn't it? Because Jesus had just worked a miracle that the disciples could not previously achieve. But why? Why is it that Jesus could achieve it, but they could not? We know that Jesus said, it was due to the disciples' lack of faith. He then goes on to say that regardless of the situation, that devil would only be expelled from that young man by prayer and fasting. But wait a minute. Did Jesus have to pray and fast? Or did he just command with authority and that demon came out of that young man? Or, did Jesus just command the devil and he just came out at once, like we, it appears to be so? Did Christ misstate something to the disciples? Not at all. Matter of fact, just before this miracle, Christ and his disciples just had come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. If you go back and read the earlier verses of that chapter you will see that Christ came down from the Mount of Transfiguration just before that miracle. As a matter of fact if you go back to verses 1 to 13 you can read all about it. Now why is this significant and how does it validate the teaching of Christ? Because it was in that mountain that Christ spent a good time actually Possibly fasting, but we know for sure that he was praying. Now, why do I say possibly fasting? We'll see in a minute. Now, Desire of Ages, page 419, paragraph 3 says that we're talking about this when he went up into the mountain. And he was leading the disciples up into the Mount of Transfiguration. This is what Desire of Ages 419, paragraph 3 
and paragraph 4 tell us. It says, The disciples followed where Christ leads the way. Yet their wonder, they wonder why their master should lead them up this toilsome ascent where they are weary, and when he too is in need of rest. So they were really in a need of rest, but yet Christ says, Come with me, we're going up this mountain. Which was a little odd for the disciples. They didn't understand what he was going to do. Presently, Christ tells them that they are now to go no further. So, so they get to a point where Christ says, Okay, stay here. Stepping a little aside from them, the man of sorrows, he does something. This is what he was doing just before he cast out that demon out of that young boy. He steps a little bit aside from the disciples and, and the man of sorrows pours out his supplications with strong crying and tears. He prays for strength to endure the test in behalf of humanity. He must himself gain a fresh hold on omnipotence. For only thus can he contemplate the future. And what does he do? He pours out his heart, his heart longings for his disciples, that in the hour of the power of darkness, their faith may not fail. The dew is heavy upon his bowed form, but he heeds it not. The shadows of night gather thickly about him, but he regards not their gloom. So the hours pass slowly by. At first, so he's now... It says hours pass slowly by. It means he's praying all this time with deep heart searching, a heart rending supplication for hours, it says. So the hours pass slowly by. At first, the disciples unite their prayers with his in sincere devotion. But after a time, they are overcome with weariness. And even while trying to retain their interest in the scene, they fall asleep. So, this reference from the Desire of Ages, page 419, paragraph 4, speaking about what took place at the Mount of Transfiguration, just before he came down the mountain to actually cast that demon out of that young boy, it does not specifically mention any fasting, but as you read the account of their journey up the mountain there, there is no mention of them stopping to take a break and eating. Matter of fact, it says they were weary, they were weak, it implies that they didn't they had not eaten in a while even if they would have just fasted those several hours there was a type of fasting or or a little time of fasting included in that time because obviously Jesus cannot be praying for hours and eating at the same time so even though it doesn't specifically mention fasting as you read the account of their journey uh, you, you can kind of see that they did not eat according to that reference plus as we read Jesus spent hours as I said a minute ago, praying in that mountain. Therefore, Christ was not only pr a praying prior to the miracle, but he must have been, or at least for several hours, fasting from food. So Jesus was teaching the disciples how he was able to command the devil to come out of the boy with such authority. When he spoke, he had absolute authority over that demon because he was connected to heaven. Now we want to understand the true significance of fasting tonight. We don't want to have a superficial understanding of fasting that you're just going to stop eating so that your mind can be clear. We have to understand the deeper, deeper spiritual context of fasting. I like the, this morning's devotion we were listening to uh, from Sister Carol where she was speaking about uh, even diet. She was including diet in her message and uh, um, discipline and all these things and how the health message is the right arm of the gospel all of that was very beautiful and it all kind of ties in to the power of fasting because fasting is a form of discipline by the way fasting is a form of discipline and it is you know something that paves a way and we're going to see that I'm not going to get ahead of myself but we're going to see that it actually paves a way for something as we move forward we'll see that now in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 29, it says that Christ taught the disciples as one having authority and not as the scribes. 
Why could he have this authority? Matter of fact, can we have authority? Is Jesus our example? This is what we want to know today. We want to know about fasting, then we have to take a deep investigation into what Jesus is saying to us tonight. Because he taught as one having authority. Not like the scribes, because the scribes were really, uh, they were, uh, they, they, they weren't, uh, what do you call it? They were more uh, pretending. They, were, they had a pretense about them. But Jesus did not. Jesus knew what he was saying, and he knew why he was saying it, and he knew, he knew the power in what he was saying. We're going to look at another example. Another example uh, often given to express the power of fasting is found in the book of Esther. Haman was on a mission, and I know most of you understand the story, but Haman, we know he was on a mission. His mission was to annihilate the Jews because, in reality, he was jealous of Mordecai, and Mordecai was a Jew. But when Mordecai understood the gravity of the situation, he did something very, very crucial. Matter of fact, it wasn't only him. It was him and another, a few other Jews. They did something. They began to fast. We find this account in the book of Esther, chapter 4, and verses 1 to 3. Notice what the Bible says in regard to this example. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, talking about Haman and how he wanted to annihilate all the Jews, when he perceived this, Mordecai did something. He rent his clothes, which was a symbol. When they rent their clothes, it was a symbol that they were grieved tremendously and that they were coming before the Lord. And he rent his clothes and he put on sackcloth with ashes. That was another symbol. That meant that they were, they were now going into this, the secret chambers of the Lord and they were going to put... That was like saying, I'm going to put my battle array on. That was their battle array. You know, when somebody would rent their clothes in sincerity of heart and put sackcloth on and ashes, you know, that was a symbol of going to war on their knees. And... So that's what we say today. You know, we, 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 sometimes we have to go and put on sackcloth and ashes. It doesn't mean we're going to go out there and look like we're fasting and dirty our clothes and put dirt on us. No. It means that we're going to go into our prayer closets. We're going to go now and we're going we're gonna to battle. We're going to get on our knees. And that's, you know, Satan, I tell you, the, 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 what makes Satan fear the most, I'm telling you, what makes Satan fear the most, what makes him tremble is when God's people get in their knee on their knees that is the war position that is where the big guns come out and satan has to try to duck for cover so mordecai did this and he went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth and in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, which was to slay all of the Jews, there was great mourning among the Jews, and something else, and fasting. Fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Notice that among the Jews there was fasting. It wasn't only Mordecai, it was also the Jews. That means the people began to get in their positions of war. And they were now praying and fasting to the Lord for protection and for a miracle. Most of us know the end of the story. Mordecai's actions inspired Queen Esther to seek for help from the Lord and all the people at the same time. And they all got together and prayed and, and fasted all together. And in the end, Haman, the conspirator, was the one that was put to death on the very gallows that he had erected so that he could put a public display on the execution of Mordecai. A, a stupendous miracle of deliverance for the Jews who were about to be annihilated. It was going to be a genocide there. So, again, what do we see? We're seeing that there's power and significance in a proper form of fasting. 
Now, whenever fasting is done correctly, we see powerful outcomes. One of the most interesting examples of the power of fasting comes from the book of Daniel. In this scenario, King Darius, the king of the Medes and Persians, was tricked by his presidents and princes to execute his beloved governor Daniel because Daniel was praying and they, they didn't like him. They didn't like Daniel. They wanted to kill Daniel and they came up with a scheme to actually get him killed. And they told the king, King, make a law that if anybody prays to, to any other being but yourself, let them be thrown into the lion's den and executed. So the governor says, oh, that's, that sounds like, a, okay, uh, you know, he, he was kind of easily persuaded, kind of. And he kind of went, went along with it. And, but Daniel prayed to God. And so, and, and he loved Daniel. Daniel was a beloved governor, you know, for him. And so what makes this one of the most interesting examples of the power of fasting is that the, the fasting in this example comes from the pagan king. Darius. King Darius wanted Daniel to be protected while he was in the lion's den. Interesting. So after the king was forced to carry out the sentence upon Daniel for breaking his decree, he then went home to fast. And it's, uh, the account is found in Daniel chapter 6, verses 18 to 27. Notice what this pagan king went home to do. In Daniel chapter 6, verses 18 to 27, it says, Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Oh, wow. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. He couldn't sleep. So he fasted the whole night. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the, li the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him for as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for Daniel, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in God. Notice the difference between Daniel and the disciples trying to cast out that demon. Jesus said they... Had they didn't believe. They had unbelief in their heart. Here we see that Daniel had belief. This is a key component. This is a key, crucial aspect of fasting and the power of fasting. Notice that both Daniel and the king had to put their faith in God. This is a pagan king who knew nothing but knew that the God of Daniel must have been a, the real God deep down in his heart because he went to go fast and pray to that God. He didn't go fast and pray to his pagan gods. So here we continue to read. So Daniel was taken up out of the dead. No man of hurt was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king commanded and they brought those men which had accused Daniel. Now notice again what happens here. A miraculous outcome. What happens? The evil that these men wanted to do to Daniel fell back upon their own heads. So the king commanded, they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of, of the lions. Them, not only them, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them, of them and break all their bones in pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the den. As soon as they hit the bottom of the den, they were dinner. They were dinner. Those lions, they were so hungry... They had not eaten the whole night because they were being, uh, they were being, uh, Daniel was being shielded. And as soon as those were dropped in the, in, in the pit, they went at him. So then King Darius wrote uh, unto all the people. Notice what this king did. Remember, he was a pagan king. King Darius, he wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. 
<laughs> what did he do? This king went and sent messages to all the earth. What did he become? He became one of the greatest missionaries. The king became one of the greatest missionaries of his day because he sent and wrote unto all people in all nations and languages that dwell in all the earth. And what did he do? He said, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. I would say the King Darius became converted. I would say King Darius became a powerful, powerful disciple and a great missionary to the ends of the earth at that time. I think he would have been able to do more, mission, uh, more missionary work than all of those that were there in his, in his realm because he went to all nations to, to, to let them know about the, the God of Daniel. Amazing. Now this is power, brethren. This is, a, this is miraculous power involving fasting. Imagine how that, that fasting was so efficacious that not only was the king converted, enemies of Daniel were vanquished, the lion's mouths were held back, Daniel was protected, and the whole world was evangelized on the true living God. Wow. Now, that, my friends, is power. That is the power of fasting. So we are definitely seeing that there is significant power in proper fasting. We saw that the disciples didn't have the proper type of prayer or fasting at that time because they didn't have, they were still filled with unbelief. Here we see that the king properly fasted and Daniel properly had faith. And then and at the same time, he was in that dungeon without any food to eat, I believe, and he must have been fasting as well, in the sense that he was not eating probably. He was probably praying the whole night also with the king. So they both were probably doing the same exact very thing. Notice that the fasting of the king did not have to be for a week. Did not have to be for two days. Did not have to be for three days. He just fasted overnight. And the power that came from that fasting was immense. So we're definitely seeing that there's significant power in proper fasting. And we're going to look at one more example. And then we're going to kind of try to break this down a little bit. This one is also interesting because, again, we see a pagan king praying and fasting. And the result is absolutely amazing and probably not even, uh, probably a little bit, I don't, probably just as, as amazing as this one. Although I don't know if it went, I don't think it went to the ends of the earth, but we're still going to see an amazing example in the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 3, verses 4 to 10. Again, Jonah chapter 3. Verses 4 to 10. Notice what the Bible tells us about the fasting incident that took place in the time of Jonah. And we know the story again. We know that Jonah went to go tell the Ninevites that they were going to be doomed in 40 days and destruction was coming for them and this was a prophecy that God had foretold. And notice what happened here. So Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So, the people of Nineveh, they did something. Notice again the key word, brethren. This is a key word. We saw it in the last example where Daniel said he believed. Here's another example, and it says the people of this pagan nation. You know, you know Nineveh was actually in Babylon, by the way. It was like the capital city of Babylon. All right? Um, and it was very rich. It was like the, the hot spot. It was like New York City, right? Like New York City is like the biggest city of, uh, uh, in, 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 you know, you know in, in America. Well, Nineveh was the biggest city and the most luxurious city of Babylon at the time, okay? And 
Here is Babylonian Ninevites, pagans, when they hear the prophecy of Jonah, the people of Nineveh believed God. That's key, crucial. Why? This is what we need in order for our fasting to be powerful and see where we can see powerful results. You see, without faith, brethren, it is impossible to please God. Anything that is not of faith is sin. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. Notice, wasn't that a Hebrew practice? Put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robes from him, and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through, throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Lest, let them not feed nor drink water. Listen to this. Did he know what he was doing? He knew what he was doing. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. That's a key clue as well. Notice what he says. Let every one turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. This is another key component of proper fasting. We're going to get into that in a few minutes. He goes on to say, Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. And then we're told something very interesting here. God saw their works. That they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Now we know this is Bible language. We know that God speaks to people on their own terms and their own understanding. But... In reality, if any destruction would have come upon the Ninevites, which did come in the future, uh, after uh, you know, a different king and other people came into power and they went in, back into apostasy, eventually Nineveh was destroyed. So the prophecy was fulfilled, but at a later time. Um, it doesn't come from the Lord, and that's a whole other study. We're not going to look at that right now. It, you know, the, the Bible's principle is whatever a man sows, that is what he reaps. You know? but, but let's go back to what this amazing uh, 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 historical record teaches us. It's amazing. Notice that the king, first of all, notice that this king not only prayed and fasted, but he commanded that all men should do the same. Now, he, did, he said nobody should drink or eat at all. Why? Because he was going into the deepest most ideal way of fasting in the spiritual sense. He didn't want anything to come in between him and his connection and his sincere prayers to the Almighty God. He didn't want anything to block his mind. He, 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 he wanted to be focused and he wanted everybody to be on the same page. So notice that this king commanded everyone to fast and to pray. He even went further Brethren, and this is, you probably didn't catch this when, we, when you read this the first time or even when I just read it now. But he, he even went so far as to command that even the animals pray and fast and be covered in sackcloth and ashes. Did you catch it? He stated, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. <laughs> that, let me tell you something. This may be, it might seem comical to us. That this man commanded not only the men and, and the people, but he commanded the animals to fast. He commanded the animals and the people to pray to God. This is how serious this king was. 
right. So it kind of seems kind of comical if you didn't catch it before, knowing that animals cannot pray and they cannot really fast. But this shows how serious this king took fasting and how much he believed the word of God. In actuality, brothers and sisters, this king, he would put many of us to shame. He understood the gravity of the situation. He believed. He was making sure that everyone would be covered. One thing of great significance that we need to take note of from what this king said is what he says concerning the real objective of fasting. He said, let everyone, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. That is the real objective. The objective of fasting is to become one with God, to come to a place where now nothing separates us from God. Because what does Isaiah 59 tell us? Verses 1 and 2, that sin separates us from God. So we need to, when we come to fast and pray, and we want to see power, the real uh, uh, element needed for power to come from that fasting and prayer, is that we have turned from our evil ways and from any violence that's in our, not only our hands, but even in our minds. To understand what this king understood. You see, the understanding of this heathen king in regards to fasting, brethren, is profound. It falls in line with the explanation given to us about fasting by Isaiah, that was given to us by Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 to 12. You see, what we're looking at now, we're looking at the true spiritual implications of fasting. What is needful for us, the condition of our heart that is needed in order for power to come from our fasting. Notice Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 to 12. This is the real uh, ingredients needed for a powerful outcome to fasting. Notice, it says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? So now we're going to go into the description of the true condition needful and what fasting is really about. What did the king say? Turn from your evil ways. Do you, don't you think that if we were to turn from all of our evil ways and any violence or any, anything that is unlike God, any unconsecrated behavior or, or, or thoughts, do, don't you believe that your prayers would be so powerful that you, anything you would ask for in His name would come to fruition? The Bible tells us that this is so. Jesus, in reality, all He had to do was pray to the Father, Father, you know, cast this, you know, remove this demon out of this young boy, and it was done. In reality, all that is really needed, brethren, for us to have power in our experience is to know the understanding of the real fasting. The real, proper, deep, spiritual type of fasting. Notice here, it's described in Isaiah 58, verses 6 to 12. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? And here is the explanation, the description of the true fast that God has chosen. What does he say? He says, this is the fast that I have chosen. To loose the bands of wickedness. Isn't that what the king told to his people get rid free yourself from the wickedness loose the bands of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke wow is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked, thou that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thy own flesh. What is he saying? These people are our brethren. We're brothers and sisters of the human family. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health 
shall spring forth speedily. Isn't this why we fast? Many of us fast because we need health. We need to overcome some ailment. Or we need some clarity. We need a deeper walk with God. Right? It says, If we loose the bands of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke, deal bread to the hungry, bring the poor and cast that are cast out to your house. When you see somebody naked, cover him and hide not yourself from these obligations to your fellow man. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, and if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Praise the Lord. You see, brethren, by now, you may be wondering how you and I could receive such power and miraculous results from fasting. You may be wondering why fasting is so significant. And in letter, chap in letter 73, 1896, we're told that certain things, for certain things, Fasting and prayer are recommended and appropriate. In the hand of God, they are a means. Listen to this very carefully, brethren, because this is the key revelation of fasting, of what the significance of fasting is and how it actually works. So I want you to pay close attention to this very quotation. God is telling us that proper fasting is something in the hand of God. It says, when you fast properly, that in the hand of God, this type of prayer and fasting, they are a means of cleansing the heart and promoting a receptive frame of mind. In other words, and it says, it goes on to say, we obtain answers to our prayers because we humble our souls before God. Notice that proper fasting are a means of cleansing the heart and promoting a receptive frame of mind in the hand of God when we do it properly. You see, prayer cleanses the heart while fasting promotes a receptive mind. Again, what's the significance of fasting and prayer put together in combination? Prayer cleanses the heart and fasting promotes a receptive mind. We must clear the rubbish and make a highway for our king. That's basically what we're doing when we pray and fast in the proper way. Now, in Councils on Diet and Foods, page 188 and 189, it says, Now and onward till the close of time, the people of God should be more earnest, more wide awake, not trusting in their own wisdom, but in the wisdom of their leader. They should set aside days for fasting and prayer. What are we told? God's people, to the close of time, should be more earnest, more wide awake, not trusting in their own wisdom, but in the wisdom of God. 
And we should set aside days, plural, for fasting and prayer. Goes on to say, entire abstinence from food may not be required. So that's not really the significance of fasting. Notice, entire abstinence, abstinence from food may not be required, but they should eat sparingly of the most simple foods. So then what is fasting really? If it's not really entire abstinence from food. Because that's what many of us are told. We're taught that fasting is only, you just stop eating and, and maybe sometimes you stop drinking and you just focus and pray. The true significance of fasting, brethren, is turning away from our evil. We have to come to the Lord in a when we have submitted to Him, surrendered our souls. That is the true fast, brethren. We also want to abstain from certain foods and eat sparingly of the most simple foods because that helps. And even if we, 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 we don't eat or drink, that's, even, that's the most ideal form of fasting and the most serious occasions. So there's different ways of fasting in regard to the physical food and drink and all that. But one thing that is for sure, the one thing that is absolutely necessary in fasting in order for there to be power in our fasting, is that we come to God emptying ourselves of self. If self is alive in us, if we don't come to God and start praying, Lord, even while we're coming in prayer and fasting, even as we begin to pray and fast, the first thing we want to do is ask God to cleanse our hearts of self and all the rubbish. And when we do that with a sincere heart, and then we clear our mind and, 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 and make a way so that we, we don't have anything distracting our digestive system, our brain is not functioning on anything else other than hearing God's direction and counsel and admonition, there will be power in that type of fasting. There will be power. So it's not uh, fasting by works. We can't come to God with a... Uh, presumptuous attitude knowing that we're living in sin not giving up those sins and then thinking we're going to have some power when we pray and fast with a corrupt heart can't it can't it doesn't work that way medical ministry ministry page 283 says that the true fasting which should be recommended to all is abstinence from every stimulating kind of food and the proper use of wholesome, simple food, which God has provided in abundance. Men need to think less of what they shall eat and drink of temporal food, and much more in regard to the food from heaven, that will give tone and vitality to the whole religious experience. See, brethren, the real deep significance of fasting is fasting from our evil ways. Getting rid of that. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 209 and 210, says the leaving of godliness has not entirely lost its power. At the time when the danger and depression of the Church are greatest, the little company who are standing in the light will be sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in the land. But more especially will their prayers arise in behalf of the Church because its members are doing after the manner of the world. The Redeemer, and this is from uh, uh, Inspiration, TSDF, I forgot what that was, TSDF 50, paragraph 6, it says, The Redeemer of the world knew that the indulgence of appetite would bring physical debility, and so deadened the, perception, uh, the perceptive organs that sacred and eternal things would not be discern this is why it's important for us to fast not it doesn't have to be necessarily of all foods but of all of those foods that we should not be eating also that's another thing another key component of a powerful fast is a fast where we put away all of those things that are not in line with God and his principles of health if we're indulging our appetites 
you can expect that your prayer and fasting might not be that powerful. Because God has given us clear instruction of how to properly fast. That doesn't mean necessarily cutting out all food and all water, but cutting out everything that is not in line with the health principles and spiritual principles of God's commandments. That means we have to put away our indulgence of appetite and indulgence of sinful thoughts in our mind or, or actions. All of that needs to be repented of and we need to be cleansed of all of that foolishness in order for our fasting to be powerful. So again, the Redeemer of this world knew that the indulgence of appetite would bring physical debility and so deaden the perceptive organs that sacred and eternal things would not be discerned. Christ knew that the world was given up to gluttony and that this indulgence would pervert the moral powers. So what is it that perverts our moral powers? Gluttony, indulgence in things that we should not be eating and actions and thoughts that we should not be thinking or doing and words that we should not be speaking. If the indulgence of appetite was so strong upon the race that in order to break its power, the divine Son of God in behalf of man was required to fast nearly six weeks, what a work is before the Christian in order that he may overcome even as Christ overcame. The strength of the temptation to indulge perverted appetite can be measured only by the inexpressible anguish of Christ in that long fast in the wilderness. First uh, testimony, uh, TT, page 212, paragraph 2, says, Fasting and prayer will accomplish nothing. Listen to this, brethren. Fasting and prayer will accomplish absolutely nothing while the heart is estranged from God by a wrong course of action. So it's not necessarily not eating and drinking. In reality, it's not eating what we're not supposed to be eating and not doing the things we're not supposed to be doing. That's the, the real true significance and, and the source of power in fasting. The Mount of, of Thoughts of the Mountain ble of Blessing, uh, page 87, paragraph 1, says that the fasting which the Word of God enjoins is something more than just a form. It does not consist merely in refusing food, in wearing sackcloth, in sprinkling ashes upon the head. He who fasts in real sorrow for sin will never court display. In other words, you're not going to go and tell the whole world you're fasting and you're going to go looking sorrowful to work or wherever you go so that people know you're fasting. Not at all. Because that's a pretense. Somebody who's truly dedicated and surrendered to God and has a real sorrow for sin is not going to go out there and make a display of their works of fasting. The object of the fast, going on, reading on to verse 2, which God calls upon us to keep, is not to afflict the body for the sin of the soul, but to aid us in perceiving the grievous character in, of sin, in humbling the heart before God and receiving His pardoning grace. That's the real objective. That's the real purpose. That's the real... Uh, ingredients necessary for this recipe in order for there to be power in fasting. In Joel chapter 2 verses 12 and 13 our final verse because we're going to close now we're given an admonition brethren. The admonition is therefore also, also now saith the Lord turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your heart, but not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth Him of the evil. 
doesn't mean God has any evil in him. It's just language. This is biblical language. It's actually an idiom, Hebrew idioms that they use in the Bible. It means that God will actually be merciful to us. Anytime that we come to him in sincerity, the Lord will not refuse us. The Lord has open arms wide open for us. He's waiting for us, brethren. He's waiting for us to come to, to be honest individuals. Because if we're living a life of hip hypocrisy, if, we're, if, we're, if we have one foot in the world and one foot in the church, that's a farce. That is hypocrisy. And, and to come to God in that condition without any deep desire for repentance and reconciliation, that's presumption and that's sin. That's a repentance or that, that is actually a fasting that needs to be repented of. We can be fasting and committing sin because it's, it's presumption. So brothers and sisters, I pray as we close now, I pray that this study would have been helpful to, to you as it has been to me. Because every time that I do a study, I know it, it's like a two-edged sword. It, 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 it slices uh, the hearts of those that listen, and it also slices my heart. And I tell you, I have been blessed by this message, and I just want to thank God for that. And so as we now close, we're going to actually uh, bow our heads and pray. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me as we thank God for this study and as we commit our hearts to Him and ask Him to continue to be merciful with us, continue to teach us, and continue to guide us and, and open up our minds. I pray that everybody that's listened to this message today understands that there, is, there are some things that are critical and necessary to be in place in order for our fasting to have power. Number one, we have to believe. We saw that early on in this study. We have to believe. We have to really, truly, 100% believe God. Believe His Word. Believe in what we're doing. We have to come with a humble heart and sincerity. I mean seriousness when we come before God. We have to uh, not be in a condition where we're indulging our appetite. We can't come to God where we just ate a cheeseburger and a french fry and come to fast after that. That, that doesn't make any sense. That, that's ridiculous. We have to prepare our bodies and mind to fast. So how do you do that? So prior to fasting, we have to make sure that we're eating the right things, preparing our bodies and mind to, to be able to cooperate with the mind. Another thing we need to do is what? Prepare the mind. How do we prepare the mind? By coming to God and in confession and repentance first. That's the first thing we need to do before we come to prayer and fasting. We have to repent and say, Lord, cleanse me of all this unrighteousness that I may be, be accounted worthy to stand before you and ask you for a miracle to come into my life as I fast and I pray to you. Fasting is primarily fasting from all of those sins, turning from our wicked ways, turning from self. So brethren, let us commit our lives to God that we may see power and miraculous things happen in our lives and in the lives of others around us. So that when we pray and when we fast, we can be an example to others and teach others. And, and as they see the miracles taking place, they will know that we have been with God. Let us pray. Dear loving Father, I want to thank you so much for this study. Truly, it was a blessing to my heart. And I know it was a blessing to those that, that heard it and who will hear it in the future. Pray, dear God, that you would help us to, to take what we've learned today and put it into practice. I pray, dear God, that it does not just go in one ear and out of the other, but that we retain this knowledge and understand how to come before you in proper fasting and prayer so that our fasting and prayer may be efficacious, miraculous, and that others will see the, the, the results and see that you are such an awesome God, that they will be drawn to you, that through that, Christ will be lifted up. Dear Lord, 
Bless everybody that's on this line and who's listening to this study. Continue to draw us closer to yourself and to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And Lord, bind our hearts to him. Prepare us for his soon coming, that we may become those end-time remnant people that will go to give the loud cry to the ends of the earth and fill the earth with the knowledge of your glory. For we know that this is your will, dear God, and you know we know that you many are called, but few are chosen. Help us, Lord, to choose you that we may be considered the chosen. I thank you, dear God. Bless everyone within the hearing of my voice. Bless our families. Use us as instruments wherever we go. For Lord, we ask this according to your will. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, with thanksgiving. Amen and amen.